It is indeed a privilege and an honor to be asked to give the annual British Society of the History of Mathematics annual lecture at Gresham College this year. For me, it's particularly poignant since I will be talking about Carl Pearson's Gresham Lectures at Gresham College. In the first part of my talk, I want to give you a biographical sketch of Carl Pearson to tell you about his family, his education, along with his aspirations to find the truth, and his quest to leave behind a legacy that would survive him. These twin motives came to fruition through his Gresham Lectures of Geometry from 1890 to 1894, which I will discuss in the second part of my talk. It was these lectures that provided the material and the impetus to propel Pearson to change his career from that of an e a respectable elastician, that is someone who created mathematical algorithms to measure elastic properties in matter, to that of a mathematical statistician. Pearson was, however, more than just a statistician. He could be regarded as a Renaissance man in Victorian London. His professional interests ranged from mathematical physics, structural engineering, the law, and astronomy, and then to philosophy, socialism, history, <laughs> literature, and finally to Darwinism, evolutionary biology, heredity, Mendelian genetics, medicine, physical anthropology, and craniometry. He also was a socialist and a feminist. He wrote a passion play and a romantic novel. And he founded the Men and Women's Club to encourage discussions between the sexes. And it was here where he met his wife, Maria, and they had three children. Additionally, he also contributed hymns to the Socialist Songbook and coined the word siblings to represent a group of brothers and sisters regardless of, of sex. This would have been equivalent to the German term Gigeschwister, which Pearson would have first learned about when reading 17th century German folklore and literature. With his seemingly inexhaustible energy and his entrepreneurial drive, he secured the funding to set up four laboratories at University College London, or UCL. He played a pivotal role in some of the institutional changes that were going on at UCL at this time. He founded the School of Engineering and later set up the Department of Astronomy in 1904. It was here where he established his biometric school in 1893, which became incorporated into the school into the Draper's Biometric Laboratory 10 years later. This then became the Department of Applied Statistics in 1911, named by Pearson to commemorate the memory of Florence Nightingale as the passionate statistician who had wanted to set up a Department of Applied Statistics at Oxford University in 1891 with the aim of teaching future politicians how to make sense of statistics when they got to parliament, which has never yet happened. It has to be said. <laughs> uh, great, great motive to aspire to her. With Francis Galton's insistent request, Pearson established the Galton Chair of Eugenics in 1907, whilst his anthropometric laboratory was launched in 1924. If you look at this photo of UCL here, the main building with the rotunda and the portico was where Pearson would have taught engineering and then statistics. The Draper's Astronomical Laboratory was represented by the two small observatories in front of the main building, which he called the Transit House and the Equatorial House. Regarded by some as one of the most inspiring teachers of his time, and as someone who had an unusual power of influencing others, most of Pearson's students found he was never too busy to help them. The provost of UCL, George Carey Foster, recognized Pearson's power of thinking, his conscientious care in his work, and his success in inspiring pupils. Over a period of 28 years, Pearson founded and edited seven new academic journals. 
of which Biometrica remains the best known and is one of the most prestigious statistics journals. Pearson's writings were voluminous. In the course of his lifetime, he published more than 650 papers or books. And there are 400 of these that are statistical. The main set of his collected papers, which consist of 235 boxes containing family papers, scientific manuscripts, and more than 20,000 letters, have been reposited at UCL. His arresting appearance was characterized as a typical Greek athlete with finely cut features and crisp curly hair with a magnificent physique reaching a height of six feet. Even as an older gentleman, to some he resembled an old du English duke and had a wonderful face and was considered to be an extremely beautiful old man. He was regarded as a pertinacious conversationalist and in any personal discussion, his twinkle, his humorous twinkle with his gray colored eyes could be disarming. And whilst he fought for the acceptance of his statistical methodology, he sometimes found it hard to see both sides of an academic argument. And for this, he relied on W.F.R. Weldon to defend him from the trenchant attacks of others. Pearson was not really a polemical sort of person. It was the interplay between his energetic drive, his educational training from the Cambridge Mathematics Tripos system, and his intellectually intimate relationship with Weldon that enabled the two of them to create a methodology that would become the cornerstone of modern mathematical statistics. The second son of William Pearson and Fanny Smith, Carl Pearson was born in Islington in North London on the 27th of March, 1857. Whilst his parents spelled his name, Carl, with the letter C, it was the University of Heidelberg that changed the spelling of his name using the letter K when they enrolled him as a student in 1879. He used both variants of his name interchangeably until 1884, when he adopted Carl with a K in his homage to, to Pierce, in his homage to Germany. His father, William, read law at Edinburgh and went to London to qualify as a barrister. He was admitted to the Inner Temple in 1850 and became a QC and one of the masters of the bench of the Honorable Society of the Inner Temple. The Pearsons were a family of dissenters and of Quaker stock. Carl's mother, Fanny Smith, whose father was a Unitarian minister, came from a family of mariners who built ships in Hull. Carl's education began when he had French lessons at the age of four at his home on the Camden Road. A couple of years later, he and his brother Arthur went to a small school in Harrow established by Mr. William Penn. After the family moved to Mecklenburg Square in Bloomsbury, the boys happily attended University of London School. Carl stayed for seven years until he was 16 years old. When he was 15, his father was looking out for a good Cambridge Wrangler to prepare him for the mathematics tripos system which was, at that time, the most prestigious degree in any British university. Carl then went to Hitchin Boys Schools, 33 miles from Cambridge, where he received tuition in mathematics. He stayed for five months. Very unhappy there, he left to go to Merton Hall in Cambridge to be coached in mathematics under John Edward Rendell Harris, John P. Taylor, and the great mathematics coach, Edward John Ralph. He stayed for a year until April 1875, when he received an open fellowship from King's College. And although Pearson was not a very healthy child, he came to life in this environment, and his health improved. He found out the highly competitive and intellectually demanding system leading up to the mathematics tripos 
was the tonic he needed. Students of the mathematics tripost were also expected to take regular exercise as a means of pre preserving a robust constitution and regulating the working day. Pearson carefully balanced hard mathematical study against such activities as skating, ice hockey, and lawn tennis. When the weather was vile, he worked out indoors with dumbbells, and he also played billiards. His mathematics tutors included Arthur Cayley and George Stokes, along with Isaac Todd Hunter and James Clark Maxwell. As a diversion from studying mathematics in his second year, Pearson read works from such romantics as Goethe and Shelley. He also read Rousseau and Dante and wrote a couple of books on, a couple of articles on Spinoza for the Cambridge Review. Pearson graduated with honors as a third wrangler in the mathematics tripos in January of 1879. For the Victorians, being placed a high wrangler was a mark of enormous intellectual and social distinction. The top three wranglers were presented in all the newspapers, which may be seen in this slide. Subsequently, he received a fellowship from King's College, which gave him financial independence for seven years. He was made an honorary fellow in 1903. A couple of weeks after Pearson had taken his degree, he began to work in Professor James Stewart's engineering workshop where he got his hands dirty like a real engineer. During the Lent term, he read philosophy and medieval languages in preparation for his trip to Germany. The money from Kings meant he could spend a year in Germany attending lectures and perfecting his German. He left for Heidelberg in April of 1879 with the hopes of finding out whether he wanted to work in physics, philosophy, the law, literature, or mathematics. All of them were options for him. By this time, Carl, who was 22, had rejected Christianity. He had subsequently adopted free thought as a non-religious faith that was grounded in science. He distinguished this from a free thinker who was a person who formed ideas about religion on the basis of reason, without recourse to authority or established belief. His socialistic outlook was similar to the Fabians, who encouraged gradual changes rather than Marxist revolutions. Nevertheless, Pearson never joined the Fabian Society, despite the many requests from Sidney and Beatrice Webb. Socialism was a form of morality for Pearson. The moral was social, and the immoral was antisocial in conduct. Pearson's time in Germany became a period of self-discovery. The romanticist and the idealist discovered positivism. He thus adopted and coalesced two different philosophical traditions. For idealism deals with nature and personal feelings, whilst positivism dealt with science and professional goals. By then he had begun to write the new Werther, an epistolary novel on idealism and materialism published in 1880 under the pseudonym of Loki, who was a mischievous Norse god. His passionate Germanic interests were, un were, sorry, were underscored his desire to find the truth. And they were pursued while he was writing papers on mechanics, elasticity, engineering, philosophy, and optics publishing papers, I should say. For a young romantic idealist, Pearson's ongoing search for the truth, which was of, of paramount importance to a Cambridge-trained mathematician, became a template for the work he pursued and ultimately shaped the direction of his career. In Heidelberg, Pearson studied physics and metaphysics under Kuno Fischer and Gustav Kirchhoff. After reading the works of Berkeley, Kant, Fieck, Locke, and Spinoza, he was beginning to find that his faith and reason had been so shattered by the merely negative results 
which he found these great philosophers. But he despaired his little reason leading to anything. He subsequently abandoned philosophy because it made him miserable and would have inevitably led him to shortcut his career. In November, he went to Berlin to study physics with Hermann von Helmholtz and to spend time in Heinrich Kavicki's laboratory to make measurements of physical quantities. During this time, Pearson also continued to read books on medieval and 16th century German literature. He hardly knew why he wanted to do this, for he had so many different impulses which were leading him in such opposite directions. He considered becoming a mathematical physicist, but decided not to pursue this since he was not a born genius, unlike James Clerk Maxwell. Since philosophy did not lead to the truth, and as he would not find success in physics, he was determined to go to the bar, and he subsequently stayed in Berlin to read inter International Roman Law by Bruns and Theodor Mommsen. He had hoped to pass the Roman law exam in London in March. When his friends visited him from Cambridge, they found that Karl's enjoyment of life in Germany was so immense that he was even cracking jokes with Schwabian dialect whilst drinking his beer. He was very much at home there, and according to friends, Karl got quite exuberant at times and was far more emotional and enthusiastic in Germany than he was in London. Pearson even established himself as a welcome visitor in the little village of Zeich, where years afterwards he returned to meet those people he had known as children. He returned to Germany regularly, especially as he longed for freedom from the social constraints of a rigid class system in England, and bemoaned that the English masked their feelings that their society had thus become artificial. Shortly after returning to London in 1880, he decided to read law and was called to the bar one year later. However, after Carl undertook his only legal case, which involved setting up a partnership deed for two turnip top sellers at Covent Garden Market, don't have many of those nowadays, he realized that he hated the law since he found the work desperately agonizing, uninspiring, and too dull to pursue. He decided instead to devote his time to the religious producing of German literature before 1300, as one does. By the 1880s, London was full of idealistic young men who, like Pearson, were dissatisfied with conventional politics and religion. They were searching for new ways of understanding and changing their society. From 1880 to 1884, he lectured in various academic institutes and working men's clubs in London. He lectured on Martin Luther's influence on the material and intellectual welfare of Germany. And he gave lectures on Karl Marx and Ferdinand LaSalle at revolutionary clubs in Soho. His talks were very popular and often sold out. When he arrived at a lecture in Blackheath to deliver the first of his 20 lectures on German society from the medieval period to the 16th century, he was met at the door by just two Germans. However, by the time the lecture had begun, there were more than 250 people attending the lecture. He was pleased that the lecture was more successful than he had anticipated but it made him wonder how crowded the lecture room might have been if there were no lecture fee. In his pursuit of German history, Pearson consulted his friend and the Cambridge University librarian, Henry Bradshaw, who taught him the meaning of thoroughness and patience in research. With Bradshaw's help, Pearson finished in 1887 a collection of the Veronica images of Christ. He became such an accomplished philological scholar of medieval German folklore literature and its language that he was shortlisted for the newly created post in German at Cambridge. However, in spite of his accomplishments with German literature, 
Pearson longed to be working with symbols and not words. He would thus have to find work as a mathematician. After having been rejected from more than six mathematical posts in a period of two years, he received the Goldsmith Chair of Mechanism and Applied Mechanics at UCL in the summer of 1884. Pearson lectured single-handedly 11 hours weekly and taught mathematical physics, sound, light, electricity, magnetism, wave motion, and hydrodynamics to engineering students. Still dissatisfied a month after he began teaching, he lamented to his Cambridge friend, Robert Parker, if I only had a spark of originality, genius, or what have you will, I would never have settled down to the life of a teacher, but I would have wandered through life in the hope of producing something that might have survived me. Clearly, he wanted more from life <clears throat> than just teaching statistics. Nevertheless, it has to be said that Pearson had no trouble captivating <clears throat> the interest of a classroom that held some 80 to 100 engineering students for 11 hours a week. He felt there was a sense of power and inspiration in maintaining a class full of 80 to 100 students. Otherwise, failure would have meant riots. His colleague, the eminent chemist, Sir William Ramsey, once remarked to Pearson that we are the only men in college who can hold big classes in complete silence. Looking for a change from his usual teaching responsibilities, he applied for the professorship of geometry at Gresham College in 1890. By then, he had abandoned the pursuit of religious, philosophical, and literary truth and began his search for the numerical truth. As a Cambridge Wrangler, <clears throat> Pearson learned to use applied mathematics as a pedagogical tool for determining the truth. For Cambridge Wranglers, the truth meant one that provided the means of producing reliable knowledge. In solving problems based on recent research, students were showing their ability to apply the tools of truth to obtain the correct answer. Indeed, they sometimes produced better answers than their examiners had done, thereby showing how reliable the tools were in the right hands. Moreover, given the dominance of Euclidean geometry in Victorian Britain, Pearson regarded geometry as a mode of ascertaining the numerical truth and as a fundamental process of statistical inquiry. Since nearly all of his teaching at UCL on dynamics, mechanics, and statics had been based on geometrical methods, he had proposed to give lectures on the elements of exact science, the geometry of motion, on graphical statistics, and on the theory of probability and insurance, in addition to pure geometrical courses. As a Gresham professor, he was responsible for giving 12 public lectures a year, delivered on four consecutive days from Tuesday to Friday, during the Michaelmas, Easter, and Hillary terms. The lectures, which were free to the public, as they still are, began at 6 p.m. and lasted for one hour. These lectures were intended for the laboring classes, artisans, clerks, and others engaged during the day in the city of London. Pearson thus had to make his lectures accessible for this group who would have had no grounding in mathematics. Pearson not only used various types of scientific instruments, diagrams, and magic lanterns to teach statistics, but he also used dice, coins, and the returns from the Monte Carlo roulette to teach probability. He once scattered some 20,000 pennies all over the lecture room floor and asked the students to pick them up and arrange them into heads or tails. The result was very nearly half heads and half tails, thus proving a law of averages and probability. After a lecture on experimental deductions, which involved the use of 16,170 throws of the ball at the Monte Carlo roulette table, along with teetotums, 
and 2,138 tickets from the lotteries, one of his students remarked the lecture was like an opera, but without the last act. It is perhaps not surprising that his students had increased from five to tenfold in the first couple of years. By 1893, nearly 300 students were regularly attending his lectures. The lecture room halls would not have been able to seat that many, so it's been suggested that they just came in and stood or sat down, not having to worry about health and safety laws. <laughs> in Pearson's first eight Gresham lectures of geometry, he wanted to introduce his students to a way of thinking that would influence how they made sense of the physical world. These lectures form the basis of his positivistic and iconoclastic book, The Grammar of Science. However, it was his remaining 30 Gresham lectures on the geometry of statistics that provide the framework of his statistical innovations. Pearson endorsed Sir Thomas Gresham's ideal that lectures should address the application of science to practical life. And it was for this reason that Pearson chose statistics as a topic for this group. For insurance, commerce, and trade statistics all dealt with matters of practical life. He also thought his students would be able to relate to such games of chance as Monte Carlo roulette, lotteries, dice, and coins. In his first Gresham lecture on 17 November 1891, Pearson had already begun to redefine statistics, and he argued that we cannot confine statistics to just social problems. Statistics was not just a branch of sociology, as it had been envisaged by the early to mid-Victorian statisticians. But to Pearson, it also belonged to zoology, evolutionary biology, astronomy, and therefore to mathematics. Pearson divided statistics into two parts. Pure statistics was that branch that dealt with the computation, representation, and handling of statistical data. Whilst applied statistics was the application of that statistical data to various classes of facts, which could be used in the biological and social sciences. In this lecture, he recognized that statistics was becoming an important instrument of investigations, which could play a role in evolutionary biology especially in measuring Darwinian variation, determining the numbers destroyed in the struggle for life or natural selection. Pearson, however, needed a very large set of data to test his ideas. His first 18 Gresham lectures on statistics covered material relating to games of chance and probability, some of which were influenced by the works of John Venn, William Stanley Jevons, and Francis Isidro Edgeworth. Pearson could see there was plenty of scope to extend his ideas with statistics, and he seemed to sense he was on a threshold of creating a new statistical methodology. The catalyst that would bring about this transformation of statistics came from Weldon in November 1892. Pearson first met the Darwinian zoologist Walter Frank Raphael Weldon at a meeting at UCL in 1891. And it was Weldon who would exert the single greatest influence on Pearson's career as a statistician. Weldon, who took the natural science tripos at St. John's College in Cambridge, was a committed Darwinist who was looking for a working hypothesis to fit Darwin's theories. But after he realized that the morphological and embryological methods he had learned at Cambridge did not enable him to examine the variation that Charles Darwin emphasized, he began to use the statistical methods of Francis Galton for his experimental work on marine organisms. Weldon regarded the problem of animal evolution as essentially a statistical one. Weldon and Pearson's emphasis on measuring Darwinian biological variation and statistical populations of species not only implied the necessity of systematically measuring variation, but it also prompted the reconceptualization of a new statistical methodology. When Darwin suggested that evolution proceeded by the accumulation of minute differences, 
He introduced the idea of continuous variation into biological discourse. Pearson recognized the fundamental statistical concepts in Darwin's work. So he thought that every idea of Darwin from variation, natural selection, reversion, and inheritance seemed to demand statistical analyses. As the evolutionary biologist Sewell Wright remarked in 1931, Darwin was the first person to effectively view evolution as a primarily a statistical process in which random hereditary variation merely furnished the raw material. Ernst Meyer considered Darwin to have introduced population thinking into biology. Hence, a statistical process was indeed necessary to bring the new species into predominance. Darwin's idea of continuous variation forced 19th century naturalists to reconsider the traditional definition of the biological species. Up until the middle of the 19th century, species were defined in terms of types. Among museum taxonomists, this, bio, this typological interpretation of species became known as the morphological concept of species. Since even similar species showed systematic difference, morphological differences, thus individual organisms could in principle be duly assigned to one species or another. Although morphological data might suggest that species were outwardly identical, they might, not have been they might have been reproducibly isolated, as this slide here indicates. <laughs> DNA testing today can indicate if two ostensibly distinct species are, in fact, one single species. The transition in measuring biological va variation, rather than simply calculating averages, enabled Pearson and Weldon to create the tools that led to a new statistical paradigm. When they translated Darwin's ideas about what kinds of natural processes occur in the world into statistical concepts. Consequently, they had to find a new way of thinking about statistics, which involved devising methods to capture individual variation rather than simply calculating arithmetic means. They also had to move beyond the limitations of a normal distribution as the model of statistical analysis and to standardize empirical frequency distributions. Pearson's work on curve fitting, and especially his Pearsonian family of curves, did much to dispel the almost religious acceptance of the normal distribution as the mathematical model of variation of biological, social, and physical phenomena. During the Easter term of 1892, Weldon and his wife Florence collected a thousand adult female shore crabs from the Bay of Naples and took 23 measurements. Weldon found that 22 of these measurements were normally distributed, thus confirming Galton's assumptions on normality. But Weldon's attempt to analyze one of his distributions became problematic when he realized that its shape was bimodal or double humped, as Weldon called it. Weldon immediately asked Pearson for his help, and Pearson spent the entire summer working out a statistical resolution. And he produced this asymmetrical distribution. Pearson did not want to normalize a distribution as Galton had done, because Weldon's bimodal curve might have indicated that a new species had arisen. This marked the beginning of their long and fruitful venture that would lead to Pearson's creation of a new statistical methodology. From 1892 to 1898, Weldon was looking for empirical evidence of natural selection in the Plymouth shore crab by examining the differential mortality rates, which is a Darwinian measure of fitness. The changes in the physical conditions of Plymouth Sound was due to the rich deposits of China clay from Dartmoor and the pollution from the great dockyard at Devonport. These environmental changes meant that the relative frontal breadth of the crab, which contains the breathing apparatus, which are the points between C and D, was becoming narrower over time. 
Moreover, very finely divided china clay killed crabs where the frontal breadth was larger. To help Weldon interpret, to help Weldon interpret his statistical data, Pearson had to standardize the system of frequency distributions to accommodate very large sample sizes. Prior to this, people could only analyze data with about 50 samples. Weldon was then able to plot the differential mortality rates of more than 1,000 Plymouth shore crabs. The outer fairly normal, normal curve shows the distributions of all the crabs before natural selection. Whilst the inner flattened curve shows the survivors whose frontal breadth was narrower, thus allowing them to filter water, but not the china clay. Weldon then became the first scientist to provide empirical evidence of natural selection. By showing the destruction of crabs in Plymouth Sound due to the environmental changes in Plymouth was selective. Until Pearson standardized his frequency distributions, the only procedures available for classifying a massive amount of data had been the use of pie charts and various diagrams or the reduction of data to make a smaller subset, as Weldon Galton had advocated. Some of these methods could be unwieldy since the graphs and charts came in all different sizes, thus making comparisons difficult. Although the Victorian economist Alfred Marshall thought that graphical methods for frequency distributions ought to be standardized, it was Pearson who provided this requisite methodology. Consequently, it then became possible to make comparisons and generalizations between other data sets that had previously been impossible to make. Less than two months after Pearson looked at, his, looked at Weldon's data, he used the mathematics and mechanics to show his students at Gresh as Gresham students in February 1893 how to calculate his newly devised standard deviation, which correspond to the moment of inertia, whilst covariance correspond to the product moment of dynamics. By using the standard deviation, variation could be measured at all points on the distribution rather than just the two or three points that Galton had offered in 1874. In his next lecture on maps and chartograms, Pearson coined the word histogram to designate a time diagram, which was to be used for historical purposes, hence the word histogram. The histogram was a graphical version of continuous data, such as time, inches, and temperature that shows a number of cases that fall into adjacent rectangular columns that are contiguous with no gaps. A similar looking graph is a bar chart where there are gaps between the bars and it uses discrete data such as gender and political affiliation. For Pearson histograms could be used for such blocks of time as reigns as sovereigns and different prime ministers. By November, Pearson had worked out his statistical system based on the method of moments that he'd first learned at Cambridge. The term moment originates in mechanics as a measure of force about a point of a fulcrum. In statistics, moments are averages. Using the first moment, Pearson taught his students how to calculate the arithmetic mean by, de by determining the point at which the lever bounces on the fulcrum. The mean is the balance point of this lever and is equivalent to the center of gravity in mechanics. The second moment is used to find what Pearson called the squared standard deviation, which Ronald Fisher termed the variance in 1918. The third moment indicates which of the lever balances on the fulcrum is used to find a measure of the skewness of a distribution. An unbalanced lever is analogous to an unbalanced normal distribution or a skewed distribution. The fourth moment measures how flat or peak it is the curve of the distribution, for which Pearson coined the word kurtosis, which means bulging or arched. It has three components. Leptocurtic refers to what Pearson called the peakedness of a distribution. Platocurtic was so called because its shape resembled a platypus. 
and mesocritic referred to the normal curve. These terms were subsequently illustrated by one of Pearson's students, William Silly Gossett, where you may see a platypus and two leaping kangaroos, which is a very effective tool in teaching his students to remember these terms. Continuing to use Weldon's data on problems of evolution, Pearson introduced the coefficient of variation in February 1894. From the method of moments, Pearson established four parameters for curve fitting to show how the data clustered, the mean, how it spread, the standard deviation, if there were a loss of symmetry, skewness, if the shape of the distribution were peaked or flat, kurtosis. These four parameters describe the, dis the essential characteristics of any empirical distribution. The system is parsimonious and elegant. These statistical tools are still necessary for interpreting any set of statistical data, whatever shape the distribution takes. Because depending on the shape of the distribution, different statistical methods will be used, or should be used anyway. Pearson resigned from his Gresham post in so the spring of 1894, because the preparation of 12 annual lectures, along with his teaching commitments at UCL, left him no time at all for any other research work. Moreover, his doctor urged him to resign due to ill health, no doubt brought about by, brought about by overworking. By this stage, he had created the, mathematical, created the infrastructure to mathematical statistics. Eight months later, he began to teach statistics at UCL, because as he put it, he was interested in devising the modern theory of statistics. With such well-attended Gresham lectures, his public life was well-developed by the time he began to teach statistics in his biometric school at UCL. Pearson knew about Alexander Kennedy's student engineering laboratory at UCL, which he had set up to develop the system of laboratory teaching. This, in turn, served as a model for Pearson's first mathematical laboratory at UCL. This grew into the Draper's Biometric Laboratory, which he set up in 1903 from a grant from the Worshipful Draper's Company, who provide funding annually for Pearson until his retirement 30 years later. He instituted the first ever degree course in mathematical statistics in Britain in 1917. Whilst Pearson continued to work on curve fitting and finding a goodness of fit test throughout the 1890s, thus leading to his chi-square goodness of fit test in 1900, his work was interrupted in 1894 by Francis Galton, sorry, whose contributions to Pearsonian statistics has to do principally with his recognition of the explanatory significance of using correlation instead of causation when two or more variables may be related to each other. Moreover, Pearson's transformation of Galton's hereditarian ideas of biological regression to a purely statistical one between, sorry, sorry uh, to a purely statistical concept gave statisticians a tool to determine if statistical predictions could be made between two linear related variables. Pearson student George Uni Yule introduced a conceptually new way of interpreting regression when he added the measures of least squares to interpret it. Weldon introduced the idea of a negative correlation whilst Galton's influence also led Pearson to introduce 28 methods of correlation, of which 10 remain in use today. Pearson went on to devise the standard error of estimate, multiple regression, and introduced the higher level of mathematics into statistical theory, which was a precursor of matrix algebra. For Pearson's statistical innovation, he was elected a fellow of the Royal Society in 1896 and was awarded their Darwin Medal two years later. To conclude, as a Gresham professor of geometry, Pearson was unique in producing lectures that launched a new mathematical discipline. Darwin's ideas not only precipitated a new way of statistical thinking that led Pearson and Weldon to create a new methodology, but Pearson was able to leave a legacy behind that has indeed survived him. 
Moreover, a statistical methodology not only gave, not only, sorry, not only transformed our vision of nature, but it also gave scientists a set of quantitative tools to conduct research accompanied with a universal scientific language that would standardize scientific writing in the 20th century. Thank you. Thank you.